I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. You can now listen to all of our episodes and see show notes at FriendlyAtheistPodcast.com. So I'm here today at the American Atheist Convention 2015 in Memphis with uh, Jennifer Michael Hecht. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Um, So you're the author of a couple of books, and I would love to talk to you about them. Your newest one is called Stay? Yes. And it's about suicide. Yeah. The subtitle is A History of Suicide and the Arguments Against It. A History of Suicide. That's such an interesting tact to take. Yes, uh, and it was quite fascinating to find out how mm-hmm. how people's ideas about it changed over time. But this was always very much a secular uh, argument against suicide. A secular argument, and how would that differ from like a religious argument? Obviously, there's the afterlife to consider, I suppose. Well, more a question of uh, religious people uh, in the. It was not always thus, but by the Middle Ages, uh, Christianity was very against suicide. Mm -hmm. And so people who wanted to dissuade others from doing it could really just say, God doesn't want you to do it. Indeed, it was a worse crime than murder. Um, It was understood as a worse sin than murder. Mm -hmm. Um, So what inspired writing this book? Well, I lost two friends. I'm so Um, sorry to hear that. Uh, we were not extremely close, but that's uh, at this point, right? Uh, sure. We had all, we'd all um, we'd all gotten our PhDs at Columbia in the '90s, uh, and uh, I in history, history of science mm-hmm. was my field, and uh, they in poetry. But I write poetry too, so that's that's how we, gotcha. we knew each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, after the first loss, I wrote a poem mm-hmm. uh, called "The No Hemlock Rock," which is. Um, Easy to find all over the web. Garrison Keillor reads it on the Writer's Almanac, uh, and somebody made a video of it. Um, and and this poem was really an, a sort of the beginnings of the argument against suicide, and, mm-hmm. and it just got such a meaningful response that I kept thinking about its argument, and then uh, about a year and a half later, uh, the... the the friend of our, ours who had actually written the posthumous uh, afterward to mm-hmm. the first one's uh, last book, uh, she did it. Um, and so it was in a kind of a real shock and dismay uh, that I wrote a blog post on mm-hmm. the Best American Poetry blog uh, site where I, I often wrote. And, and it was really a kind of manifesto against suicide, mm-hmm. very much from an atheist, skeptic uh, mm-hmm. Viewpoint, and that got that went a little viral, sure. um, and was actually the Boston Globe picked it up and and published it on the back of their ideas section one Sunday, and uh, I got a lot of mail. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still do get a lot of mail from people saying that it helped them, and so that's when I really decided, all right, I've got to um, follow up on these ideas and and mm-hmm. check everything out. And um, is this is the book targeted toward? toward those who are considering suicide? Is it targeted toward those who have lost somebody to suicide or all of the above? Um, and also people who are just interested in moral ideas mm-hmm. and and how we um, make changes in how we think about things. You know, the, the sort of progressive, left-wing, uh, secular side of things generally argues these days that... Um, it's everybody's right. Indeed, having a right to suicide is mm-hmm. a pillar of our autonomy. Uh, and that's why I was rethinking it along those lines mm-hmm. and saying, look, uh, there, are, there are specific reasons. And one of the reasons is that Christianity was so draconian against suicide, yeah. uh, which was a historical development. You know, I, I was able to sort of tell that story of how they became that way. Because neither Jews nor ancient Greeks were that against suicide, and that's where Christianity comes from. So there was no reason for it to have happened. What happened was the martyrs, um, the emperors would actually sometimes say, if anybody else here wants to die for Christianity, go home and do it yourself. The court doesn't want, and people would. Mm -hmm. The thing is, after Constantine makes uh, Christianity no longer illegal in 313, the the martyrdom, self-martyrdom kept going. And so the church was really hemorrhaging members. Instead of having these people um, defending the religion, they were actually losing people. And and so they started to announce at different councils, starting around the 400s, 500s, mm-hmm. um, 
that you'll be struck from the list of martyrs if your suicide was actually even in part because you wanted to die. Hmm. Uh, and so then they just got more and more uh, strict about it to the point of um, mutilating corpses after death, drawn and quartered was standard, and uh, confiscating the estate so the family would be in penury. So that, you know, in some ways it, it protected some people. They, some people write about, how, you know, they, they, they leave information saying that they might have done it otherwise, but that um, that got them through a bad night. Now, the brutality of it, though, and the nonsensical aspect of it uh, really struck people in the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so there were uh, mostly, uh, David Hume is, is one of the people who really wrote against uh, the church's stance on that mm -hmm. and made it seem like the secular position should be to almost welcome suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and they sort of misread the ancient texts too to, to see a lot more positive uh, ideas about suicide than there really were. Yeah. Do you think kind of spinning off that, do you think there is a danger in putting too much merit in something that somebody wrote a thousand years ago or 500 years ago and like modeling your life off it? Well, yeah, but if that's also uh, what we human beings do, right? Mm -hmm. we, so we, we take from the store of wisdom mm -hmm. what suits us. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's interesting is that, you know, whatever political side you're on these days, red state, blue state, you, you, we tend to take the menu of positions mm -hmm. of that, including their shoe styles, right? You're going to wear Birkenstocks if, you're, if you believe this. Yeah. I mean, and so what, at least, you know, I, my PhD is in the history of science, but I sort of think of myself as an intellectual historian because I follow ideas through history. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, 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 that's my job to to think about some of these things and to see what it's based on and whether it really holds up. Mm -hmm. And I, I came to believe that suicide is so harmful to other people, including fatally harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, more, it's very contagious. It's very influential. Mm -hmm. So when when it, one happens in a school, very often, it's not always, but but very often, mm -hmm. you'll see a spate of them. And uh, that was sort of this initial notion that. Um, uh, you, you know, you, uh, I say in the poem, if you, when you poison yourself, you poison the well. If you shoot yourself, you crack the biodome. Um, it's very harmful. And the other argument that I found through history as well is um, about respect for your future self. The idea that 10 years from now, mm -hmm. you're going to know things you don't know now. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you don't have to have that much respect for him, but at least don't kill him. Um, try to try to realize that you have a you have a future that you don't know about right now, and um, yeah, it, it's been remarkable talking to people about these things. And and I get uh, I certainly get backlash from people who just you know that's they don't have anything particularly new to say. They just say they have a right to do it. And I certainly believe if. Here's my, my test, is if, there were, if there's any medical personnel or anyone in your family or any of your friends think that, okay, maybe it's time for you mm -hmm. to go, mm -hmm. you're in a different category. Sure. That so needs to be a duty. Assisted, of course. Assisted, yeah. That's yeah. Different. There's no issue with that. It's not about sanctity of mm -hmm. life. It's about um, recognizing a little bit that secularism in particular has created an idea where we each are supposed to make our own meaning and also judge our own life in terms of the pain that we have and the contribution that we're making. And that's a really crazy thing to say to people. Um, meaning is has always come from community and culture. Mm -hmm. and the fact that we thought it was God for a while there doesn't, ma doesn't change that we've been doing this on our own the whole time. Mm -hmm. And when you start to think about how meaning and community function and how you sometimes have to trust the opinion of other people. If you know yourself that everyone who knows you would not want you to kill yourself yeah. and you know that in other moods you'd be horrified, yeah. um, that should be enough to slow you down, mm -hmm. to get you to wait the day or two that, that it very often takes. Yeah, absolutely. So interesting. Um, so your other book is Doubt. Let's mm -hmm. talk, can you give me a kind of brief summary of? Sure, Doubt is a history of religious doubt mm -hmm. and philosophical doubt mm -hmm. uh, all over the world throughout time. So I uh, 
the earliest really worked out doubt that I, f I found was 600 BC, the ancient Karvaka in mm -hmm. the Indus River Valley. Uh, they said, you know, if there were uh, souls, could, if souls could exist without bodies, you, you could also have mangoes hanging in the, in the sky without trees. Oh, interesting. But there aren't, and they don't. Um, they said if the priests really believed what they were saying, they should just burn everyone's parents now and, and send them up to heaven. Mm -hmm. um, they really worked out a whole lot of um, philosophical ideas about, you know, they said nature seems capable of reproducing itself and of, of novelty through whatever kind of accident, mm -hmm. and that must be what's going on now. So that kind of says to me, maybe I'm misinterpreting that religion or the belief in a creator or something was kind of the default for a very long time. Is that an accurate um, um, you know, I, I believe that, uh, not only I believe, I can show that more people have not believed in God than mm. have believed in God through history. Mm. So you take the millions of Confucians. Um, the Confucius theory is, is a, it's a social theory. It's about respect right. for people who have more power than you and um, generosity towards people who have less. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're talking about millions of people right mm -hmm. there. Theravada Buddhism has no God. Um, and then there are, of course, the religions that have gods or something that m maybe has the same word, but is a very different thing from the Judeo-Christian God. So the, the truth is that the, you know, when I wrote out, I, I said in the introduction, it's like learning to see a map upside down. It takes a minute to see it, but mm. I tell the whole history of the world through through the atheist side, through the doubter side. And that means that the periods that are often called moments of dissolution um, are actually our uh, great times, yeah. right? Because that, that's when things get cosmopolitan and sophisticated and mm -hmm. some of the more um, entrenched beliefs are all breaking down. Mm -hmm. And that's a moment where science usually does very well and uh, and there's usually some equality and uh, and a lot of secularism. So there's kind of inverse correlation between religi religiosity and, you know, things developing and in, in, civilization is the word I was looking for. Right, in a lot of ways, yeah. Interesting. I mean, is it hard when you go back and look at scientists or just people who have lived years ago, so like Galileo, for example, mm -hmm. Everybody knows the story that he was, right. um, you know, persecuted by the church. Is it possible to know if he actually believed or didn't believe, or is it a little speculation and in reading into what he said and what he wrote? With someone like Galileo, yeah, uh, it takes some. He's not someone who is very forthcoming in that way because mm -hmm. he's mostly a scientist, right? Sure. So he's not. Um, but you know, he did. The rumor has it he said, "Still, it moves," uh, meaning meaning the earth. Um, mm -hmm. But we do. He, you know, eventually they just put him under house arrest. But he was a kind of an old man by then. It yeah. wasn't such a big so. Um, but he was definitely willing to speak up to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, what I found through history is. Um, well, someone like Einstein. I had to comb through a lot of letters to mm -hmm. find where he actually does say, um, because someone sort of asks him directly. He says, no, of course I don't believe in a personal God. Uh -huh. um, he, he, you know, he's, uh, he's very clear about materialism. Um, uh, Darwin writes in the margins of his, of his own notes, mm -hmm. you materialist, you, um, and uh, makes it clear that, that he uh, has a has that kind of a standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. But he was careful too, because that's not, that wasn't his main thing. Yeah. Um, but I found atheists at every moment of history. I, I did think going in, I, I knew a lot about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd already been a historian for a long time when I decided to write it. So I'd always noticed the atheists, because I am one. And uh, so I knew I had a story to tell. And it was amazing to find out how much more there was, mm -hmm. and that there was no dark age where there are no atheists around. Mm -hmm. uh, there are periods where you can't find many in Europe, but you can find a ton in the Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. um, in the, the golden age of, of Islam is an age of uh, science and philosophy, and um, people sitting around a table making fun of the Quran, uh, mm -hmm. saying if this was God's book, the metaphors would be better. <laughs> But can you tell, or is it difficult to tell whether there aren't a lot of atheists around or there aren't a lot of, quote, out atheists? Can you tell the difference, or is, it, does it matter? Well, you kind of can. Um, people leave records of 
uh, atheist clubs mm. um, with all sorts of different names, uh, free thinking, libertine, uh, but the the there's always a record that lets you know, for instance, which city in the world is the hotbed of atheism. You can sure. find a city, at least one city at, at any moment in time. Mm -hmm. It was Amsterdam for a while. It was Baghdad for a while. Mm. Um, and of course, Paris and London and New York. Um, there And Padua uh, was the atheist town for a long time. Uh -huh. And that's where you would go to university if that was the way you want to think. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's hidden because it's dangerous, but there's uh, people who leave posthumous manuscripts saying that they never believed. Uh, and, yeah, all over the world, certainly in the East, it's a different kind of atheism, uh -huh. but there are people who say, I don't believe in karma, I don't believe in any of this magic stuff, mm -hmm. uh, right through history, yeah. Interesting. And what about, I feel like in the last five years or so, people have been really hung up on the Founding Fathers. Were they Christian? Mm -hmm. Were they deists? Mm -hmm. uh, what did you find there? Well, um, the Founding Fathers and uh, the, the founders in general, mm -hmm. so including some women, uh, were mostly deists. Uh, I think Jefferson was at least... Uh, uh, I, I, he, he gives us indications that he's not a believer. He, he wrote to uh, a favorite nephew... Uh, question everything, even the even the existence of God. And if you come to believe that there is not none, don't worry. You'll still be virtuous f because of how it makes you feel and how the people around you mm -hmm. will respond to you. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not something I think you say if uh, you're not an atheist. Right. He also the Jefferson Bible is when he takes the New yeah. Testament and crosses out every supernatural reference mm -hmm. in it. He thinks Jesus was a great teacher and wouldn't have been foolish, right. and so therefore this stuff must have been added by other people. Yeah. Um, and so he thinks he's just cleaning it up. So uh, we also have a lot of evidence about some other presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln, uh, his best friend, and his wife uh, all said he never uttered a word of religiosity, hmm. never seemed to believe at all, and definitely rejected Christianity. Mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm really would wonder if something like that kind of gained traction, if, if people found out, if that became sort of a bigger deal, how people would react to such a beloved leader right. taking such a controversial, controversial, in many people's opinion, right. position. Well, look, I'll tell you. Uh, what I have come to uh, understand is that this, this, the first half of the 20th century was a real great time to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Edison is on the uh, in, in New York Times saying, yeah. "Of course, there's no there's no afterlife. I mm -hmm. believe in proof. I believe in material things." Um, there were, uh, you know, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who really creates the feminist movement, mm -hmm. gets kind of kicked out of it for being such an out loud and proud atheist. Uh, I think it's. 1890, she comes out with the Woman's Bible, which she tried to get a whole bunch of people to contribute to, but she ends up writing most of it herself. And <laughs> it's just a hilarious takedown of religion. And uh -huh. it's not all, it's not just feminism. It's also just mocking supernaturalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so the late 19th, early 20th century is a great time to be a public, uh, publicly known atheist. But what happens is, and I, I can show this happening all over the world at different times about different religions. For instance, the Spanish Armada um, in uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, I, uh, she allowed a lot of tolerance towards Catholics until the Spanish Armada tries to take over England, mm -hmm. um, in which case it becomes treasonous to be Catholic, Catholic right? Because you're on the and that's really what happened in this country. Mm -hmm. The Cold War made it so being an atheist seemed like it was too close to being uh, the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And that's when God went on all the money and God went into the pledge in the 50s yeah. specifically to counteract, to, to separate ourselves from. So, but look at it now. A lot of atheism had to go underground. We lost our history mm -hmm. because we hadn't talked about it for a while. But now our most murderous tensions are with people who think of us as the secular ones. And they 
seem to us the religious fundamentalists. Mm. So that's a big part of the reason that there's such a sea change, that we're beginning to be more uh, willing to be vocal about atheism again, and, and people are talking about it again. So a lot of things that I think if you don't know the history, it looks like, oh, those, you know, the bad old days stretch all the way behind us, and mm -hmm. we're uh, at the razor's edge of modernity, and it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're just, in some ways, correcting for a, an understandable response that atheism was sort of on the wrong side in terms of the Cold War. Interesting. So as a historian yourself, how dangerous, I guess for lack of a better word, do you see somebody like David Bartman, who, Bartman, that's his name? The, he's like a... He's a Christian who goes back and has released books about like how the founding fathers are super religious and super Christian. Uh -oh. And do you think that's a dangerous thing to be teaching people to try to like apply your own lens to history? Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the the difficulty is, you know, we're talking about people who um, also uh, own slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're we're not following them wherever they went right. anyway. We're willing to give up some of their stuff. But it is, it, there's also a way in which every generation thinks it's less devout than the generation before because they've stopped doing some of the things their parents made them do. Mm -hmm. But if you really knew everything your grandparents did, you'd blush. Uh, there's a lot of times where we go back and look and find much more freedom of thought mm -hmm. uh, at different periods. So do I think it's dangerous to when people lie about history? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also... It's okay. Uh, yes, it's very dangerous when people lie about history. It, it, the, the fact that this country is the kind of experiment it is, mm -hmm. is such a huge... You know, we get into such despair about trying to fix the world, and we do usually make big mistakes. On the other hand, this country was an idealist experiment, mm -hmm. and we're still here. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of, of a republic this large, uh, nobody thought you could do it. They thought, mm -hmm. you know, Athens size, you could have a democracy, but, yeah. but any larger. And, and even a lot of the Enlightenment figures thought a country this large would have to be maybe a constitutional monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we certainly have to remember what kind of a place this, this was. But it's also true that there are, um, you know, we all know the, the Pew research in, uh, I think, 2012 that showed that the nun, people who say nun about uh, their religion, mm -hmm. are the largest growing yeah. uh, uh, segment. So, you know, it's, it's tricky to judge this country because we're so um, diametrically opposed sure. and yet... Uh, even if our side loses an election, we think of, oh, this country's so bad. Well, it's, you know, still the 49.5%, but we, right. you know, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I had a question, and I completely forgot about it. So you have the book Doubt, you have Stay. Do, you've written other books, correct? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, my PhD thesis turned into uh, a book called The End of the Soul, Scientific Modernity, Atheism, and Anthropology. Mm. Um, and it, it was about a bunch of late 19th century French anthropologists, men and women, mm -hmm. who decided to prove to the Catholic Church that the soul doesn't exist by dissecting each other's brains after death. Oh, and indeed, uh, they were going on, a, a guy named Paul Broca found mm -hmm. the first relationship between brain morphology and personality or traits or abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still called Broca's aphasia, if you have a lesion on the third left frontal circumvolution of the brain. Mm -hmm. Should we start? Yeah, okay. no, it's fine. We'll hopefully that won't. There we go. So it's still called Broca's aphasia if there's a problem with the, the third left frontal uh, circumvolution of the brain. Mm -hmm. And um, so these people decided to sort of invent anthropology mm -hmm. uh, on the basis of that and on the basis of uh, a woman named Clémence Royer translated Darwin's Origin of the Species into French. Mm -hmm. And that's how the French got it. And, it, and she wrote a f huge forward to the book saying this proves atheism. Huh. So the French got a version of Darwinism that was different than anybody else. It, it was loud atheism. Mm -hmm. and, and so atheists, who, by the way, had been living under the Third uh, Republic, uh, that is, they'd been living under the Third, the third Empire, Emperor, um, 
sorry, the yeah. Third Empire, which was Napoleon the Third mm -hmm. uh, Empire. And I'm going to say that again. You can. Yeah. So they're living under Napoleon the Third's empire for most of their lives. They grow old under it, mm -hmm. and they can't speak their minds, and they're fired from jobs when they do. Mm -hmm. And then the Third Republic is established. It stays very conservative for the first years, and then it opens up and really becomes a democracy that is, uh, that is secular. Yeah. And so suddenly they can speak. So it's this older set of people who, and, and Broca does the does the first two autopsies and then he dies and they autopsy him. He is the third autopsy. So, uh, and men and women from all over France wrote in their uh, pledges to the Society of Mutual Autopsy, which is mm -hmm. what they called themselves, and, um, and told why they were doing it, uh -huh. like wh why, they were, why they were so angry at the church and why they didn't believe. So it was an exciting and fun project, but that's also where I realized that we had a desperate need for a history of atheism because mm -hmm. I was looking for one to, to help me provide context, and everything I found was just too polemic. Either mm. people saying there's never really been any atheists, or the atheists clipping quotes a little bit to make sure. it look like people were definitely atheists when in fact they were something a little bit more foggy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to tell the truth. Yeah. And, um, but it really was an incredible project. I, I, met through history so many men and women who were able to stand up for themselves and who liked life better without a deity. Who's, yeah. She's like, you know, this is freedom and this, is, this allows me to understand what human beings are mm -hmm. in a way that's so much deeper and richer and also allows me to realize that, um, you know, I'm the one who phrases it this way, but that, that if God didn't make morality, and he didn't, uh, than we did. Yeah. And, and I'm very impressed. And many <laughs> other people have been as well, that yeah. human beings came up with the idea of being good in this certain way mm -hmm. and that we try. Yeah. We fail, but we try. <laughs> when people say, oh, there's never been a real atheist or things like that, do you mm -hmm. think that's disrespectful or naive or what do you think about that? Well, I think it is disrespectful and it is naive. Uh, there's also just a lot of foolishness out there, so you could be convinced of that without... Uh, it's, it's a situation where um, certainly after someone dies, you can say they believed. Uh, sure. There was a huge movement in Europe against um, lying priests lying about deathbed conversions mm. um, and the family saying he never did convert. We were yeah. there the whole time. He, he believed in materialism to the end. Darwin, they said, fam famously, they said Darwin had his deathbed conversion, which no, that there's is not no, based on that's right. any fact, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's, it, but, you know, there has to be a book where people can go and get that information. And so that's why writing doubt was just such an important yeah. thing for me and why I continue to, um, you know, go around talking about it because it changes your entire experience of atheism to realize that you have a long, strong history yeah. of brilliant, kind, generous, interesting people. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh, well, that's about our time. Um, where can people find your writing? Your books are... Find them on Amazon, yeah, presumably? Yeah, on Amazon and in bookstores. Uh, yeah, I didn't even mention I have three poetry books. Oh, okay. And, um, and yeah, someone recently said sh she wears a lot of hats, but her head is poetry. I thought that was great. Oh, yeah, I love it's that. It's true. That is where I live. <laughs> I live in the poetry. And I've sort of invented something called poetic atheism, which is uh, just a version of atheism that is a little less... Uh, dependent on science because I'm sort of taking back the side of the patrimony that we've always had, which uh -huh. is the, the poets and the artists who have been, because they were atheists, they became poets and artists because mm -hmm. they needed a way to deal with reality. Sure. So that's, and, and that's the book I'm working on now, Poetic awesome. Atheism. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, it was fun. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant. That's he -Man T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. We hope you'll join us next time.